Hi everyone, so today I'm doing a video about the GB paragliding team. I've been meaning to get this out for a while and I haven't posted in a while on this channel. It's just things have been very stop and start, what with isolation, things opening up again. It's all been a bit of a mess, but this video has got footage taken from the past two training days that we had as a team, the first two training days in a long time actually. So it'll be a various vlogs and snippets from those days but as you may be able to tell may or may not be i am actually in edinburgh right now so tomorrow is our competition simulation day for russia so we're basically going to be um, mimicking what would happen on the day of the world championships in moscow but yes essentially this video is going to be about the wonders of the gb power climbing team and all the amazingness that comes with it i really want to talk about the different classifications and some of the awesome athletes that I compete with. So first up, what is paraclimbing? Paraclimbing is an adaptive and inclusive form of climbing. It gives people of all kinds of impairments and disabilities the platform to train and take part in climbing. There's various opportunities to take part in a paraclimbing from a competitive sense. So the BMC run national competitions where I'm really passionate about getting more and more people involved in that and knowing about it. I'll leave some links in the description for that. And then obviously for those that represent the Great British Paraclimbing team like myself, there's also the international competitions which are uh, governed by the IFSC at the moment. But with the recent inclusion of climbing at the Olympics, I hope everyone enjoyed that. I thought it was absolutely unreal. But now the IOC are coming in. I think once we can get uh, paracl paraclimbing in the Paralympics and we'll be moving over to that format uh, in terms of how things go down. But today I basically just wanted to talk about the different categories and classifications that compete in paraclimbing and just showcase some of the amazing athletes that I don't think get the exposure that they deserve in my opinion. So firstly we have the visually impaired, the B categories is what they're known as and they're basically leveled in terms of severity of your visual impairment. So you've got B1, B2, B3. B1 would essentially be fully blind and uh, they would be deemed as the most severely visually impaired. Those athletes essentially have to wear a blindfold to essentially ensure that they all are all climbing blind. Um, those of you that don't understand that reference, do check out Jesse Dufton's video climbing blind um, because that is uh, visually impaired climbing at its absolute peak and it's a really good watch. It's on iPair so I strongly recommend you check that out. So then you have the B2 category, which is slightly less severe. Athletes can often see some of their like peripheral vision. So for example, one of my fellow competitors on the team and also on Apex Climbing coaching team, Richard Slowcock is in this category. And what you'll often find is he'll, when he'll be looking at something that's directly in front of him, he'll turn his head to the side because they're direct eye to eye level of vision isn't as strong as their peripheral vision sometimes and then you've got the b3 category which is less severe than that um, again peripheral vision can come into play here the severity is judged on two factors for these categories and that's your visual acuity and your visual field which are two ways that a visual impairment is measured so an example of a competitor in this category for the GB team is Abby Robinson. She is an amazingly strong and flexible as well climber uh, and she is the world champion. I'm just going to now plug some footage of the athletes that I've talked about climbing at some of the recent training events.
categories though, for me one of the key and most interesting elements is the sight guiding. Sight guiding is a really key skill because it is all about connecting with the climber. The relationship between the sight guide and the climber is really important. If you take Jesse Dufton for example, him and his, his partner and his belay Molly are really closely connected and you can see that when they're when they're climbing together when you're visually impaired you need to make decisions fairly quickly because obviously i imagine it's probably easier to pump out while you're assessing where to move for holds but an interesting story actually was from the world championships the japanese team were communicating to their climbers with a, a bit of rolled up paper so a lot of the athletes use headsets to communicate with the climbers obviously helping them get to holds but strangely enough you'd, you'd think Jap the Japanese would be pretty hot on the uh, technology but they were using um, rolled up bits of paper to shout at the uh, at the climbers and um, obviously everyone has to be completely quiet in the competitions with, with those categories so that was very amusing I must say. So the next one I want to talk about is the leg amputees known as the AL categories. You've got AL1 and AL2. So the AL1 category is seated, so it means the athletes have little to no use of both of their legs. They're essentially putting themselves up the walls with their arms most of the time, so camping, which is pretty amazing to watch. I'm not going to lie, when I was watching it in Briançon in France, I was pretty mesmerised by it. Just felt very humbled to be part of everything when I saw that. Some examples of some athletes in this category, I strongly recommend watching the World Championships in Innsbruck recently because performances from Angelino Zella and Pavitra Vandenhoven were pretty remarkable. You can watch those on the IFSC YouTube. Um, but it's a real inspirational thing to watch. I think athletes like them and many other athletes deserve more exposure because what they're doing to me is, is top draw. <laughs> it really is. But of course that's the case for so many athletes on on the para climbing scene everyone is breaking those barriers and achieving amazing things so then you've got the al1 category which is a single leg amputee so athletes here have the option to either use a prosthetic leg or not use a prosthetic leg the gb athlete at the moment on this in this category is Stu sneddon who's a really cool guy really strong climber but i also want to give a special mention in this category to my friend and co-trustee of our charity which is tom stabbins he was the one that essentially introduced me to the national para climbing events and he's a really inspirational guy so here's some footage now of the awesome climbers in that category So that now leads me on to my category. Boink. Arm amputees. So you've got two categories in this. You've got the AU1 and the AU2. The AU1 category is essentially for those that don't have any use of their of one of their arms at all. Obviously for me, it's super important that I still have a lot of strength in my short arm. But for the AU, AU1 categories, obviously they're just using one arm. But yes, of course, that leads me on to the AU2 category then. That is my own. Um, I don't know why I keep showing my arm because I'm sure you've all seen that already. Uh, but this is essentially people that still have some use of their shorter arm. People use all kinds of, of things on their shorter arm. I use, I use tape and a lot of people do that. Some people use like a little a glove sock. You'll find people with sort of longer, thinner, small arms. And then some athletes that maybe have just uh, missing fingers. But the other guy in my category, Matthew Phillips, is the world champion and he has been for a while he's a pretty tough guy to come up from to come up against i've been pretty used to sharing a silver podium to his gold on the national stage but i'm getting closer to him i feel um but he's a super strong climber very All dynamic right. and he's rightfully the champion of the world but another another key sort of point between me and matt is because he's missing the other arm we read routes completely differently so it's kind of like not that helpful when I'm reading with 
the roots with Matt in competitions because he's obviously much stronger on the left side and I'm much stronger on the right. So now I'll show you some footage of me and Matt and um, other arm amputees uh, doing their thing. Finally, sorry if you can hear the, the bagpipes in the background by the way, but finally we got the, the RP category. This is a bit more of a diverse and perhaps less clear-cut collection of impairments, um, but it can basically range from neurological impairments or things that just affect your range and stability perhaps. And the RPs are basically divided up again based on severity. So. Obviously RP1 being the most severe and then RP3 the least in terms of assessments but it can be a bit brutal the classification process for these athletes because they don't always know which category they're going to be in when they rock up to the comps or if at all sometimes. So for me someone with perhaps in my eyes a less severe disability in terms of day-to-day -day life my classification process is very simple. I just walked into the room and they saw, right, he's got one arm, bang. But apparently it was the quickest one people have seen. But I guess, again, it's the, the lack of competition in some of the categories that can bring um, some issues with merging and reshuffling of categories. So it's a very tough one to get right for everyone. I completely understand that. But Hannah Bowen, for example, she doesn't have much use of one of her legs, but she chooses to compete in one of the RP categories because she feels that the competition level is more suited to her, which I find really cool. And, and she's still smashing it in that category. She's still world champion and still killing it. So big respect. And here's some clips then of some of the RP athletes on the GB stage. So what's next for para climbing? Well, obviously Olympics just happened. It was a big success, I think, but the IFSC are still running their competitions and I believe that's gonna be the case for the foreseeable. Uh, and we'll start to line up with the IOA, IOOC. And I believe the Paralympics we are targeting is Los Angeles 2028. A fair way away, but these things take a lot of time to iron out. There's a lot of stipulations to the level of competition and the classification system which needs to be all ironed out. Some of the main challenges that come with uh, bringing a sport to the Paralympics is obviously there's the financial aspect, you need to prove that it br brings a certain amount of commercial value of course and then you have to get a certain level of countries signed up and certain level of competitors in each category and then there's also the element of classification. Not all of the categories that we currently provide competitions for in the IFSC come under IOC regulations. Unfortunately, some of our athletes may have to miss out with these new changes, which is a real shame. It's hard to get it right for everyone, but uh, that will be part of the journey, making a system that's inclusive for as many people as possible. I just feel 
really humbled and privileged to be part of it all. I never expected making the team to, to be a thing. I literally came along to the national events for a bit of fun and then 2019 I got the call up and it, and it really has changed my life since then. I guess having an impairment that's easily recognised but doesn't obstruct me much in my day-to-day -day life puts me in a really lucky position because I get to soak up the benefits like being in the GB Paris squad and I, I don't have some of the stresses that some of the other athletes get with with classification and, and also just day-to-day -day management of their lives so I've got a lot of respect for all the athletes that I compete with and then of course there's the the uh, extra element that I was born without my my arm and it's all I've ever known so I've never had to adapt it's been exactly the same as a lot of people would experience being brought up with two hands uh, for me with one but then there's a lot of athletes that have, have lost let's say their legs for example in, in all kinds of potentially very traumatic experiences and that's a whole new dynamic to adapt so let's also just talk about the competition format that we go through on a, a para climbing competition so very similar to what you would see in, in the Olympics you have an observation period where you get to look at the route and essentially read how you're going to climb that route which has been a real learning progression for me understanding your ability and visualizing how you're going to climb something because essentially when you, you climb the route you get one shot at it and if you're off you're off so it's not like when you go into your local bouldering gym and you can just keep trying that boulder until you get it you'll only get one shot at it but yeah after the observation period you go into isolation with the other athletes uh, until you're called upon to to do your route you have two normally two qualifying routes and then a set criteria those highest ranked athletes go through to the finals the other thing i just want to mention is the route set and i think the route setters deserve massive credit because there's so many different inclusive needs to cater for and i feel like the feedback i've always heard has been very good but they always get it on point and i feel like it's a really underrepped element of climbing in my opinion i think it's those massive plaudits but yeah i just want to finally talk about the climbing community in general and the para climbing community there's not loads of um, money going into climbing at the moment and a lot of the the work that bmc does is volunteer based so i hope with Paralympics and Olympics now coming the funding will increase and there'll be more progression hopefully for the sport going into the future so I hope you guys found that informative and, and learned a bit about paraclimbing uh, I've just been utilizing my time here at Edinburgh to, to do this vlog but obviously I'll be in Raffo tomorrow with the guy with the team not climbing unfortunately but it is actually the biggest I think climbing center in Europe it's based in a massive quarry so it's a pretty awesome place just to be in and I'll be able to sort of film some of the action for you guys there but for today that's over and out